Hi, I'm Arlo. And I'm Scrap. Welcome to the evening of Future Self Productions. You're going to see lots of clips and interviews about the past, present, and future projects. Mm. And of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't introduce the creators of Future Self Productions. That's a great idea! Mm -hmm. Well, one of them is tall and handsome. And of course, the other is short and... Uh, smart looking? Of, of course, I'm talking about Cameron Garrity and Adam Krutinger. Mm -hmm. Adam builds all of the puppets for Future Self. Yeah, and Cam sends a lot of emails. Oh, I, I think he does a little more than that. But uh, anyways, Adam builds some of the best puppets that America has ever seen. Oh, and Cam makes a killer spreadsheet. Do you guys think this is working? Yeah, th this is good. good. Yeah. We're, we're using puppets for this? Well, you want you want us to do it? I I, I think it should just be us. Okay. okay. This isn't, yeah. This isn't very great. Okay. That was good. Yeah. And it actually makes sense too because then we do do it. Right. You think we got it? I think yeah, we got, we got it. it. Yeah. Go yeah. go together. So when I was in high school, I started off doing uh, school plays and musicals, and I did a lot of them in the community as well. And I was always in the background. I didn't have any major roles. And usually, when you were in the ensemble, you had to make your own costume. So that's how I kind of came to sewing and a lot of the, the prop building that, uh, that I do now. So I did Little Shop of Horrors at a local uh, theater company. And that's where I found puppetry. That's where I met, that's where I met Zach Commissar. So Zach had this puppet that, that he called Sebastian. And I saw this puppet that Terry Angus built. And it was just, it was, what a piece of art it was. Seeing it up close, and just the it was so inspiring to see that, that puppet. And I knew immediately that I, I wanted to start building puppets. I grew up as a pretty big Muppet nerd. Um, all of my oldest memories as a kid was of watching Sesame Street and The Muppet Show, um, performing my own puppet shows in living rooms and at dinner parties. And um, it was always, you know, the Muppets and, and working with those people was always sort of a, a dream of mine. I got introduced to Cameron Garrity in 2004 in grade school and found out there was a kid who liked the Muppets there. And I myself was collecting everything Muppets growing up so, you know, I figured we'd have a similar interest. So I met him second or third day, and I went up and said, Hey, are you Cameron, the kid who likes the Muppets? So he turned around, and he goes, I will pay you double whatever the bullies are paying you to leave me alone. And I was taken aback. I was, no, I'm serious. I am a big Muppet fan. I started naming off the Palisade toy collection, what I had, and right then and there, we knew we would be friends. So, and that, that, um, that obsession, that, that passion continued into college, which is when I started performing in actual shows um, and building some of my own puppets, um, which is when I made the first scrap. Uh, and, and very uh, shortly after that, I met Adam for the first time. In 2010, I was in a production of Evil Dead the Musical. I was a puppeteer in that, an actor in that as well. But in that, there was a production assistant uh, that was uh, that saw that we were doing puppetry and I would bring extra puppets just for fun to, uh, to entertain some of our friends. And she came up to me and she said, you know what, I have a friend that's obsessed with the Muppets. Cameron met Adam Krutinger. Uh, we met one day uh, at a coffee shop. And then it really, did, it clicked very quickly. We became friends. So at the beginning it was a lot of just shop talk and experimenting with different characters and Adam had a real large stock of, of puppets even back at that time. We started working on projects immediately together. As, as that first year went on and we, we learned more about the craft was when we started creating our own characters and started to really get a sense of how to be our own puppeteers. So Cameron met Adam and then Cameron invited me to one of their meetings at the coffee shop. And I tried on a puppet. I was a little nervous because I'd never actually done puppetry before. But it was pretty fun, and they kept me going. They uh, encouraged me to keep trying new things, new voices, pick up new characters. I had a great time. So in the early days, a lot of what Adam and I talked about was just learning about puppetry in different ways. For me, I had this sort of wealth of knowledge of how the Muppets did their jobs, while Adam had an amazing background in prop making and sculpture making and costume making. And he was able to look at archival photos that I had of the Muppets and slowly figure out some of the ways that those puppets were made. So as we learned more about how the other person needed to do their job was when we were able to start to find success in our own work. Now, there are many different ways to build puppets to serve different purposes. 
Um, sometimes a puppeteer might need to be completely inside of a puppet for kind of a big walk around character. Sometimes they're really tiny mechanical puppets that your hand isn't in, in at all, just uh, has little triggers to manipulate the puppet. Uh, your standard puppet would, would be uh, one with your hand inside operating the mouth, and your other hand uh, may have be holding rods to control the hands of the puppet. Another type of puppet is called a live hand puppet. That's a puppet that, that uh, hands are actually like gloves, so the characters can, can pick up things and manipulate props in a different way. So performing puppets can be easy, can be hard, depending on the space you're in, and it, it's very tedious. Not difficult in the sense that it cannot be done, but difficult as in the camera needs to not move, the actors need to stay out of the frame, that are, are controlling the puppets. There's, there's a lot more moving parts. So when we're performing, the camera's on us and we have a monitor underneath us. And what that does is we can see on the monitor what the camera's seeing. So we always know what the audience is going to see. Uh, so they can see their own performance and critique themselves and make sure that they have the right eye contact. But then everything's backwards. So looking left, when you move your hand left, you're actually looking right on the monitor. So that you have to learn pretty fast to get the right takedown. Because it is an art form in its own mind. And um, if you're not there to see it happen, you don't really appreciate it. So I definitely say that there is an appreciation that may not be taken uh, from taken out of it by everyone, unless you see it actually happen. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So our very first production, uh, professional production, was for a company called IBC Digital, and it was a series of three commercial set in an antique shop. What's going on? Just buying some old gold. Top dollar! Woo -hoo 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 -hoo! We had a cast of 20 or 30 puppets who kept popping up in different nooks and crannies of this antique shop. Just what I'm looking for! Just what I'm looking for! Throwing things off shelves, everything and anything was happening in this series of, of commercials. These prices are unbelievable! Working on the commercials for Just Looking made us realize exactly how we need to change our puppetry. Below the frame of the camera was a group of um, us four puppeteers who had never worked on a professional set before. I found a new appreciation for all the hard work that goes into working on a television show or commercial. All the behind the scenes stuff, all the workings of the camera, the sound equipment, the lighting. We knew even then that we could do better. Performing on stage is, is a little more forgiving, but the camera picks up on all the little details of the puppet. So we knew we needed to raise the level of our puppet building, and we also needed to have more of a direction of, of what the plan was for the process. And, and at that point, we realized we need to start being our own bosses and trying to find our own clients to work with. I went to school to be a, a graphic designer, and one of the things that I enjoyed most about um, taking advertising classes was doing storyboards for commercials. Um, and in The Legacy of Jim Henson and The Muppets, some of his earliest work was creating these short, interesting commercials that really pushed the boundaries of what his own puppetry could be. So I was really excited uh, when I was fresh out of college when Adam told me that we had got this client um, at, a, at an ice cream store who wanted puppets to be incorporated into their own commercials. I got a call from Sweet Johnny's, which is a candy store in Williamsville. And uh, he contacted me because he wanted to make a short video uh, of a puppet in his candy store. He just wanted to make a little video to post on Facebook and, and get some shares, get a little more exposure for his company. And I saw this as an opportunity for us to make a really nice portfolio piece, to make it like a, make it into a, rather than a little short video for Facebook, um, make it into like a real commercial. Snickers, M and M's, chocolate chips. <laughs> they have ice cream too. So we storyboarded and built puppets for this really quick, fun commercial that tried to capture and sort of express the joy that a little kid would feel the first time that they walk in to a candy store. We wanted that feel of, of Willy Wonka and you know going to that fresh new place um, for, the, for the very first time. Performing Jimmy for Sweet Jenny's commercial was a lot of fun. Um, 
I, I kind of saw Jimmy as, as a lot of my students. Like when we started a new art project, their eyes, when they see what we're about to do, they're so excited about it. And th that's what I also wanted to instill in this character. When he walks into this candy shop, just to be overwhelmed. Like the, in, the, in the one part you see, he looks up and he's just kind of frozen in his, where he's standing, looking up at the big wall of candy and just overwhelmed by this colorful shop. This place is awesome! So Sweet Jenny's was also the first time that we um, did any digital manipulation to our commercials. So we knew that this puppet was going to be jumping up into the air. It was going to be a full body shot. Uh, but when you have full bodied characters who have arms and legs that need to be manipulated, you have even more puppeteers working on this tiny little, little puppet character. Um, so what you need to do is rotoscope them out to, to digitally erase them. So all you saw was that final puppet. So I put, I put rods in the back of each of his feet so that a puppeteer could control both of his feet. The arm rods were, I made them out of a more malleable rod so that we could bend them into different, uh, different ways and, uh, and hide the puppeteer so the, the, um, uh, so Dave who was rotoscoping had a little less work to do. I remember Adam and I, we kept getting calls from Dave, um, who, who had to spend like two weeks on this, like second and a half of of, of footage just to make sure that you didn't see any any remnants of, of the puppeteers but the final final piece looks so wonderful and realistic we we're just so happy with with how this this final piece came out this is a story about the time that I made the most amazing scrumptious discovery that would change my life forever giant gummy worms giant lollipops giant chocolates this place is awesome snickers m&m's chocolate chips <gasps> they have ice cream too oh. make your own discovery at sweet jenny's on main street in williamsville So obviously the next progressive step after you do your first candy store commercial is to then also do a dentist commercial. Are missing teeth leaving you with a permanent frown? Mini dental implants was one of our most ambitious projects. What was tricky about doing this was that they knew that they wanted puppets, but they didn't quite know why. Something that Adam and I were always really interested in is seeing how the puppet could live as a sort of cartoon character in the real world. What we wanted to do was really see how, how far we could push that puppetry, and, and fortunately they gave us the freedom to try that. We actually got a little over our head, especially from a performance standpoint. So how do you feel with your new mini dental implants? How do I feel? The shot of the mini dental implants when they're all around the birthday cake had five puppets in it, which, which may not sound like a lot, but it actually takes at least eight puppeteers to perform all of them whether they're doing the hands of them, or just doing one arm rod, doing the dog. We were all crammed under that little table, and there was very little space. It took so many takes to get make sure every tiny movement that each person was doing um, it was locked in. We had thought bubbles with, with thoughts of, of eating ice cream and, and singing and, and big production numbers. So we had the camera looking out from inside a character's mouth. We had puppy dogs putting dentures in their mouths. We had all these different ways that we're able to push and, and just be creative and, and new and something different from what people were, were used to seeing in their, in their typical kind of commercial. Are missing teeth leaving you with a permanent frown? Do you miss the days when you could enjoy family outings or sing in public without feeling self-conscious? Then why don't you step into my office? Mini dental implants are state of the art. Our minimally invasive one-step procedure is great for replacing missing teeth and stabilizing your loose-fitting dentures. You'll be able to revisit some of your favorite foods, like hamburgers and corn on the cob, and even grilled steak. Is financing available? Absolutely. We use microsurgery, a minimally invasive one-step procedure. So there's usually no cutting, no stitches, no bone grafting, and you could use them right away. But the best part? They're typically half the cost of regular implants. So how do you feel with your new mini dental implants? How do I feel? What an improvement. I truly feel great. Finally get to enjoy everything on my plate. I'm so filled with glee. And financing is free. Thanks, mini dental implants. 
find out what mini dental implants can mean in your life, just schedule your free consultation. Complete our easy contact form on our homepage or call us toll free. A new smile is just a phone call away. What are you waiting for? Call now. So then the word started getting out that Buffalo had this group of, of puppeteers. I was working on a feature film called Let Them Have Their Way with Monolopolis Productions. And the producer, Ryan Monolopolis, contacted me and said he wanted to do a 48-hour film project um, in 2013 using puppets. So he asked me if uh, I knew any puppeteers. Uh, and Ryan, who is a big fan of the Muppets and specifically of A Muppet Christmas Carol, knew that he wanted to incorporate um, the work that Adam and I were doing into this, this short film. And what came out of that was Before Christmas. Uh, a 48 hour film is uh, when you have 48 hours of time, you start on Friday night and you have until Sunday evening to create a movie from, from scratch. It could be very stressful. Um, sometimes you, you know you have such a limited time to make this project happen. You, you're given elements that you have to incorporate, like a prop and a line of dialogue, a specific character, um, and everything gets written and produced and edited all in those 48 hours. Well, folks, it looks like another snowless Christmas Eve in Buffalo, with temperatures in the mid-40s throughout the southern tier. Before Christmas was a lot of fun, though, because we were able to sort of push the envelope in terms of what we were doing uh, with the puppetry. Uh, we had sets that were built for us as puppeteers so we could do things where the puppets were um, sitting in chairs and um, and sleeping in beds, which is a really difficult thing if you think of the logistics of that as a puppeteer. Uh, we were walking down subway tracks and actually in a real city environment. Everything was shot on location and it was it was a lot of fun to sort of figure out uh, and at every step of the way, how how do we logistically get this puppet into the set so that it looks good on camera and so that the puppeteers are safe? Are you ready? For what? For your gift. It's always before Christmas that I remember how much you meant to me. Not a day goes by that I don't wish you were here. You are my heart, my body, my soul. Merry Christmas, my love. So after working on Before Christmas and seeing how well Ryan and, and his team were able to create this really great project, Adam and I decided that it was time for us to form our own 48-hour team, which brought us to White Rabbit. So in 2013, I graduated from Buffalo State College from the Television and Film Arts Department. My idea was to go out and start making comedies. I really liked comedies a lot. Um, I never really thought anything about puppetry. You know, I, I had seen... You know, puppets, uh, I knew some stuff about Sesame Street and the Muppets. I had worked with puppets in school when I was young, but I never thought that I would actually be doing this after I graduated. 
I go on vacation after the shoot is finished for my show, and I get an email from Adam asking me if I'd be interested in coming to be the camera operator for their 48-hour film project uh, that they would be doing in 2014, which ended up being White Rabbit. White Rabbit is a story about a young boy who is traumatized by a magician uh, early on uh, in his life and sort of works throughout his entire uh, career to to become a better performer than was expected of him by this magician. White Rabbit was great, though. It was our first time working with people like uh, Jen Kleeman and John Jablusky, um, who were our writer and cinematographer, respectively. We also brought in our good friend Chase Wolner, who um, did a lot of puppeteering and also writing, helped us edit the film. Um, but the process is is relatively the same as shooting a live action thing, but you know it's it's different. You know you focus on the puppet, um, and they're they're really neat to you know see them come to life on the screen. When they control or puppeteer these puppets, they actually turn into a living thing, whether it's a person, an animal, an alien, whatever it is. As an actor myself, uh, I don't have to work really hard to believe in the fantasy that's being portrayed because it's right there, and they're so real. But I think that I've learned a skill and I've acquired a skill that many people do not realize or many people cannot do. And that's knowing that when you're shooting puppets or you're shooting humans, it's a little different. And um, there's more attention to detail and there's more, um, you know, making sure that a lot more moving parts. For a human actor, there's one actor. But for a puppet, there could be two, three, sometimes even four people contributing to creating that one character come to life. So it's taking a lot and it's condensing it, but it's it's a very interesting process and I'm, I'm very happy to now have this in my arsenal. And when the final film came out, we were, we were proud of that work, but we knew we could do better. And that we wanted to keep doing these 48 hour films to continue to push our own envelope and to get better and to make better films. So in working on White Rabbit, we learned pretty quickly where some of the holes in our productions, where some of the holes in our production flow were. We knew that we needed an editor. We knew that we needed people on the ground to just help as production assistants and to make sure that all of the I's were getting dotted and all of the T's were being crossed because there's so many moving parts in making a movie that there's no possible way that we could all be doing everything at the same time. So we needed to bring in just more people to be working. I've worked with Future Self on two 48-hour film projects so far. I'm very excited about the work that we've done. It's great. You know, not only do we get to create a film, but we also get to create a piece very quickly. Um, with that being said, Adam and Cameron are extremely organized. I've worked on a lot of shoots, even professional shoots, where they were not as organized as these are. What was great about that that night when we were creating the movie was there were so many people working at once, and um, Jen and John were working on writing the script, and our friend Akram was working on storyboards. Jake was preparing and, and memorizing his lines and trying to find that right character. Adam was building this amazing puppet that like didn't exist at midnight when we started um, the production and by 6 a.m. this 
beautiful, amazing creature that worked so well. It was one of his best puppets he had ever made, and it just came out of that night. And you were so inspired as, as a director and as a friend and as a teammate that all of these people were coming together to serve that project and to make sure that the movie was the best thing it could be. So the 48-hour film project starts, and the day before Adam starts creating this puppet, the next day, you have something like Dust Mite, who, it's unbelievable. I mean, he has blinking eyes, he looks so real, so realistic, and it's such an amazing, such an amazing creature that I personally totally believe in. Uh, oftentimes people ask me how I built the puppets, how can I make them better, and really, the best way to, to get better at making puppets is making more puppets. I always tell people that puppet making is a process. You learn something from each puppet you do. And a lot of times I have specific goals uh, from something I'm trying to learn when building a puppet. Like a puppet that has eye mechanisms. I'll build it because I want to try that technique out. Adam's puppets are, are super light and he works really hard to make sure that they're as light as possible. So many of our, our days are spent lying on the ground with our arms over our heads for hours upon hours upon hours. And if you had a puppet character that was, was too heavy, you wouldn't be able to do your job. And fortunately, these things are, are so light and so user-friendly. It's, it's a dream to puppeteer. So Dust to Dust was definitely our most ambitious story that we had ever done. We had an A story, and a B story, and a C story, and they were all working uh, in different ways to reach this weird kind of dark comedy ending. Uh, at, at the story's core, you had a, uh, a janitor and his friend who were trying to both live up to their ultimate life's purpose. Oh, oh uh, it must be nice to have a purpose. I'm just a dust mic. At the same time, though, you have um, a character like Teresa who's trying her best to sabotage um, Joe and Mike's efforts. You know, I really think I can win this. Over my dead body. You have a father who is um, sort of at his wit's end trying to make sure that his company stays afloat. Honey, sweetie, schnookums, daddy needs his publicity. And you have a principal managing everything and, and seeing these sort of incompetent people who he has to interact with and sort of keep in line. I want you to squeeze all the life you can out of these film sets, or you're gone. Janitor, there's a mess in the hallway again. Grab the mop and clean up the plop. I'm Joe Wolner. Resident Nice Guy and janitor at the Filmson School for Academic Excellence. The Filmson brand is home to a great family of products for all your hypoallergenic needs. They make paper towels, tissues, cleaning supplies, and for when your allergies are still too overwhelming, army grade dust antidotes. I know what you're all thinking. Joe, how does a first loser like you have such loyalty to a brand owned by the guy who destroyed your chances of fulfilling your purpose on that fateful day 25 years ago? And that's a valid question. But you're forgetting that my best friend Mike is made out of such a potent dust <laughs> that the film sins are literally the only thing keeping me alive. And it turns out dust mites really love eating paper towels. Just cross your fingers and hope the principal doesn't catch on to- Go! Hi there, Principal uh, Krieger? A lot of our projects happen um, because Adam or I get, get an idea in our heads. At the beginning of each year, uh, me and Cameron, we get together and we, we try to make a list of goals for that year. It might be a funny joke that we think has some, some ground to it, or it would be a, a character sketch or, or an idea for, for a, a mission or a point of view. Whether it's a new production, uh, try to find a client for a commercial, or uh, build some specific puppets or for a 48. Uh, sometimes a, a client will approach me and Adam and they'll have an idea of what of how they want us to, to work with them on a puppetry project. So we get together and we, we try to find out what we want to do. And sometimes when we're, we want to create a new show, maybe it's, it's my idea and, and I pitch out an idea. Sometimes Cam pitches an idea and then uh, we build off of it. Other times it's up to us to go to a specific client with a spec idea or with a storyboard or an animatic and say, 
hey, this is who we are. This is the, the past projects that we've done. We would like to serve you now as for this new project. So that's what we're working on now um, with the drive-in idea, and we're taking it to various drive-ins um, throughout not only this area but in other places in the country to say, hey, you know, drive-ins are struggling, and this is a way that we could sort of force a curriculum and sort of educate people in ways that drive-ins could be saved while also entertaining people at the same time. And last but not least, we have our concession manager, Carl. Oh, Carl, you haven't been paying attention at all, have you? Oh, uh, sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Carl. They know that already. Tell us what your job is. Well, every day when I come in, I make sure to turn on the popcorn machine. Then, once the popcorn machine is all warmed up, I put the popcorn seeds into the popcorn machine and wait for it to make popcorn. Then, once it's done, I put salt and popcorn butter onto the popcorn, and then I eat the popcorn! Is there anything else that you do as your job as the concessions manager? Uh, oh, I also sell the popcorn, which reminds me, would anyone like to buy some popcorn? Other times when we have an idea for a project, it, it just comes naturally because one of us has an idea because we want to say something. For my graduate project, I, I wanted to create a show um, that would inspire kids to create art. Um, so many art programs across the U.S. are being cut from school, so I wanted to create a show where kids could continue their art education outside of school. And so Adam wanted to create a show using puppets to help promote that, that fierce creativity in children so that they could be as fearless as possible and so they can make mistakes because that's okay for an artist to make mistakes. And that's where Arlo comes in. The idea for the art show was to kind of take different elements of other TV shows that, that worked well, like uh, like Painting with Bob Ross. Was, was, it was such good instruction, but it's not something that would be as entertaining for young children. So we thought about kind of taking that principle, that idea, that style of, of, uh, of a show, and combining it with, with puppetry and giving it a little more energy. And that's kind of the main inspiration for Arlo's art show. We were doing Arlo, and there was this one section where uh, Arlo pops out of the pops out into the frame, and the background goes out of focus, and you just see Arlo. So what we had to do was we had to have Arlo get pretty close to the camera. So Adam Krutinger, who was giving Arlo his life, um, was literally sitting on top of me with his legs over my lap against the wall. Um, and it was very, very cramped. We also needed Cameron there to help control our motion. So we had three guys in this cramped basement with this huge camera, and the camera is not big itself, but we had a lot connected to it. So the camera, three people, and a puppet. And we had to make maneuvers where I had to change focus and rack it. So there was a lot going on in a very small, confined space, and I, I think it literally took us 10 minutes for our legs to get the life back into them so that we could move out of this space when we were done giving the shot that we had to get. So we're hoping to take the show as, as far as we can with it. We'd like to pitch it to different stations um, so that kids across the country can have an opportunity to learn art, especially in those uh, situations where the arts have already been cut. Oh, you're sitting around with nothing to do. Meet my friend who's furry and blue. It's Arlo. Arlo! He has his very own show. It's Arlo. So grab your supplies, let's make a surprise with Arlo. Arlo! He has his very own show, it's Arlo. Arlo's art show. Ooh. So Cameron and Adam have a very interesting relationship when it comes to creativity. I was always interested in producing shows, whether it was stage or, or for film. Um, but it was, it's always hard. There's just so many pieces that go into it that you cannot do it alone. And, and Cameron was, was the perfect match to that. And we both know what the other person does and how to critique and how to make sure that it's better. But we don't have those skills ourselves, which is what makes us such a good team. In working with Cameron and Adam, I found out how great they complement each other. 
uh, Cameron will come up with an idea, Adam will have an idea, they'll talk about it, and each of them critiques each other and makes each idea better and better. Adam and Cameron are really good at creating uh, of this partnership where they're able to bounce ideas back and forth on one another and be able to are able to create a really great final product. Um, you know, it's 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 an interesting thing because you'll have one side of the team really create this idea and the other side of the team not really care for it much, and the two will talk back and forth as to why it's not working or what is working from it, um, and then that's able to make the final project grow. I mean, the two of them together, not only are they fun, but they're so professional. Uh, literally, Cameron's ideas. Adam's uh, building of the puppets and his ideas as well, and the writing, they just come up with these creative, amazing stories, and it's so much fun to work with them, and when you work with them, it's like a new adventure every single time. You don't know where it's going to take you. So, the reason that it's called Future Self Productions is actually because of uh, a class that Adam and I both took at the National Puppetry Conference with an instructor named Robert Smythe, and Robert, uh, in addition to being a puppeteer and a playwright, is also a life coach and he always talks about being good to your future self and making efforts to be your best person today so that tomorrow when you wake up you have a foundation for even more success uh, and when Adam, Adam and I were thinking about what we should name our production group we thought future self productions was sort of an aptly named title for for a company where we're trying to do our best work, and we're, we're putting as much effort in as we can at the beginning so that we can uh, continue towards success.